the Dharma is something special. It's so special that only honest people can practice it. As the Buddha once said, bring me an honest person who is no deceiver and I'll teach that person the Dharma. In other words, truthfulness is the essential prerequisite. And there's something deep down inside of us that responds to that. Because there's so many areas of life where truthfulness is pushed aside, where honesty is pushed aside, where your basic goodness gets pushed aside. And you have to steel yourself to do things that you, deep down inside, don't like doing in order to succeed. Of course, success is defined in very narrow terms there. But something within us responds to the idea, here is something that opens itself only to honest people. And basic good qualities of the mind are called for. And success is defined in different terms. There's a sutta where someone comes to the Buddha and talks about how wealthy a particular particular person is. terms of gold and silver. And the Buddha says, well, that kind of wealth is subject to all kinds of dangers. It can be stolen. When you die, it gets passed on, maybe to heirs you don't like. Fire can burn it. Floods can wash it away. And the Buddha says it's no match for inner wealth. It's interesting that the, the number for wealth in the Pali is always seven. The ocean has seven treasures. The universal monarch has seven treasures. The person who practices the Dharma has seven treasures as well. It starts out with conviction. How is this a treasure? Well, you realize that when you meet up with difficulties in life, it's the qualities of mind that you bring to the difficulty that are really going to make the difference. There are some difficulties where money is of help and friends are of help. But there are also cases where the money and the friends don't help, can't help. There's a conversation between King Gauravya and Ratabala, the monk. Where Ratabala said, you know, the world has no protector, no shelter, there's really no one in charge. The king says, well, what do you mean by that? And so Ratabala asks him, well, do you have a recurring illness? And the king says, yes, I have this wind illness. Sometimes the pains are so great that people think I'm going to, st standing around, think I'm going to die. And Ratabal says, Can you ask those people at that point to share out your pain? Or do you have to bear it alone? And the king says, Well, no, I can't. Even with all my power as king and all my wealth as king, I can't get them to share out the pain. I have to bear it alone. And Ratabal says, Well, that's what I meant. A lot of pains in life, a lot of difficulties in life that you have to face alone. If your mind is well trained, then you have the strength and the wherewithal to face these things. And so we have to have conviction that this is true in order to develop these powers. That's why conviction is a wealth, it's something you can stash away or helps you stash away good qualities for the future. Because conviction comes down to the idea that 
the training of the mind can make all the difference in the world. And as you're sitting here focusing on the breath, you're developing qualities that will be very useful. Mindfulness, alertness. In other words, when you see the mind moving into unskillful directions, you can check it and bring it back to the breath. And you can try to remember as best you can what is skillful at any particular time. You know, some people are concerned that when they get older their brains are going to start decaying, the synapses are going to get slower and they're going to forget things. But the quality of mindfulness, if it's been well trained, can even help you notice okay, when the brain is not functioning. And that can protect you from the malfunction of the brain. And John Fuhring had a student who had been meditating for several years and then had to go in for heart surgery. He came out from the operation. And he realized that something was wrong with his brain. It wasn't functioning the way it had before. And he was mindful enough to be able to notice this, alert enough to be able to catch himself. And it took several years for his brain to get back to normal. What had happened was that they had cut off one of the arteries to the brain during the operation, so it, was, it had been starved of blood and starved of oxygen. When his brain started sending him strange signals that things didn't seem right. He was able to catch himself. For example, sometimes he would think he had said something to his wife, but his wife wasn't responding. And she told him, well, you hadn't said that to me. And he was quick enough to realize, well, maybe my brain is malfunctioning. So he thought that he had said something and then noticed that nobody was responding. He could train himself to think, okay, maybe I didn't actually say that, and so then he would say it very deliberately. And so bit by bit by bit he was able to learn how to function with a malfunctioning brain. And it was the training that had made the difference. So simply the conviction that the training of the mind is going to make a difference in your life, that's a huge form of wealth right there, because it helps you to stock up all these other treasures. The Buddha says are form inner wealth. There's virtue, the realization that if you learn how to abstain from harmful behavior, you're not going to be weighed down by regret, unfortunate memories, because the regret tends to cause you to want to forget. And the desire to forget, of course, goes against mindfulness. I know people who've done things in their lives that they've regretted, and it comes back as they get weaker, as they get older. And the way it manifests itself is the mind tends to ricochet away from those topics, and it learns how to forget. It starts closing off huge areas. There's an interesting novel by Ford, Maddox Ford, called The Good Soldier in which a man is telling the story of how he... Well, see, you wonder why he's telling the story. About his marriage. It basically ends, the wife commits suicide, his best friend commits suicide. And it turns out you discover in the course of the story, well, the wife and the best friend had been having an affair. And the man tells the story in a very peculiar way. He's jumping around. In fact, one of the challenges of the book is to try to figure out exactly what happened in what order. But you begin to realize that it's more a story of the study of this man's mind, how he tends to avoid certain topics, because he could have prevented his wife's suicide, he could have prevented his best friend's suicide. You learn that in the course of the story, but he tends to avoid that particular topic, and so he's always jumping around. And it's a good study of how the mind deals with regret. You can't think straight, you jump around. So you realize that to avoid regret, you make up your mind that you're going to be as harmless as possible in all your activities. And this is a treasure. 
The same holds for a sense of shame and a sense of compunction, i.e. shame when you not simply being ashamed of yourself, thinking you're a bad person, but realizing that the idea of doing certain activities, it would be harmful. You just feel ashamed at the idea of doing those things. That's a protection. That's a treasure. The same with compunction. In other words, you think about, if I did X, these are the results that are going to happen, and they're not things that I want. That too is a treasure. And there's a treasure of having knowledge, i.e. having heard much in terms of the Dharma. You listen to the Dharma, you listen to the chanting. Try to have that in the back of your mind, because the mind picks up all kinds of things. And for the most part, it picks up garbage. So you want to train it to have good things in the back of the mind. It's one of the reasons why we have chanting day after day after day. Some of the chants we repeat many, many times, because it's a way of drumming particular messages into the fabric of your thought. May I be happy, i.e., may I be truly happy. That's a useful thought to keep in the back of your mind, to remind yourself that this is your motivation, so that when the there's a temptation to do something that's going to be a short-term happiness, you can ask yourself, well, is this really going to make me happy, or is this going to lead somewhere else? That's why we have to chant on reminding yourself that aging, death, illness, separation, these things are normal. That's what the Thai translation, actually, of the Jaratamomi, aging is normal. We haven't gone beyond it yet. And then that contemplation on karma. All of these things are useful to have sort of sloshing around in your mind. Because otherwise what sloshes around is we've all found you sit and meditate in this tune from who knows when, songs you heard decades ago, if you've been around long enough to have many decades, come bubbling up into your mind and they just stay there. It's total, total garbage. So what you want to do is replace that with better tunes in your mind, the tune of the chanting, which then reminds you of the words. And the Dharma you've read, all this is a treasure. Generosity is a treasure as well. It's a good habit, which means not only generosity with your material things, but also just generosity of spirit. being generous with your time, generous with your forgiveness, generous with your goodwill. It's a story I heard of a man who had been through an operation and had sorely affected his memory as he got older. People would come to see him and they'd say, well, I, you know, I knew you back when he couldn't remember the people, but he was very generous about it. He said, well, okay, maybe I, I can't remember you now, but it's And he was very kind with him. And so even when his memory got affected, the generosity of spirit was still there. The final treasure, of course, is discernment, realizing what's a treasure and what's not. And as you go through life, you're, you're gathering up things. And so what do you want to gather up? For a lot of people, it's sensual pleasures, thinking that the memory of those sensual pleasures will be a, a good thing to hold on to. Well, well is it? Does it what does it really help you that you remember that you had this particular sensual pleasure or that particular sensual pleasure? It's like going out to the seashore and gathering up feathers and stones and shells and then taking them down to the bank, trying to use them as a collateral and a loan. They may be pretty things, but they have no real value. It 
which is very different from the pleasure of meditation. It may take work to get the mind to settle down. But the pleasure of concentration, as the Buddha said, one is harmless, and two, it's not a form of intoxication. It's actually a type of pleasure that is clear-headed and can be used as a basis for discernment, the ability to settle down and be relaxed in your body, and have a range of full-body awareness. That combined with concentration, as many tests have showed, is great for is what precisely what you need in order to give rise to insights, to new understandings. So that's a kind of pleasure that you can invest. And John Lee talks about getting some coconuts, and if you just simply eat the coconuts and that's it, well, that's it. That's it. You've had the pleasure of a, a full stomach for a little while and the nice taste of the coconuts, but it doesn't go any further than that. But if you take some of the coconuts and you plant them, they grow into coconut trees, and then you eat some of those, but you also plant some more of those, and then bit by bit by bit you become, a, as he says, a millionaire with a coconut orchard. And so discernment is what allows you to look at what pleasures life offers and realize okay, which ones are the feathers and stones and shells and which ones are actual money, which ones are coconuts that you can plant, and which ones will grow, and which pleasures just are there. They don't grow, they just hang around. And sometimes the memory of those pleasures can actually be painful when you realize that you can't pursue that pleasure any longer. There's no way you're going to be able to enjoy that particular pleasure any longer. You get too old, too weak, too whatever. The price of gas is going up. There are a lot of places it's going to be more and more difficult to go now. As the basics of life get more and more expensive, the, the luxuries we used to enjoy are going to get more and more out of reach. All the stuff you gathered up is just going to be a burden. You can't sell it. You can't use it for anything. But if you realize that you've got good qualities, and particularly the quality of conviction combined with discernment, as John Lee once said, a person with discernment, all you need is a machete, and you can set yourself up in life. In other words, you don't need many things, but if you've got good qualities invested in the mind, they're going to pay off. We may not like to think in terms of investment and treasures and payment and success, but the Buddha used those analogies in his teachings, and it's useful to ask yourself, when you sit and do something, how are you investing your time? If you're investing in inner treasures, okay, that's a wise investment strategy. It'll take you far.